We just got back yesterday from the men's retreat, and what a blessing it was, truly, truly a blessing. Um, the Lord really spoke through the teaching of his word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and just, I was seeking God for our fellowship. Lord, what would you have for us? What is it that you want us to do, to be a part of, or what do you, what do you want for us, Lord? We're your people. And reoccurring theme, we went to our own men's retreat last November, I think it was, Pastor Pete, Pastor David taught. They taught on the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do you hear his voice? How do you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, through the teaching of God's word? And yet this men's conference, three men, two from New York, one from California, pastors, I was reviewing my notes from the last men's retreat, and it was almost word for word for what God was speaking about following the leading of his Holy Spirit. Um, it was such a blessing, a tremendous blessing. If you're a guy and you want to pull it up, you can pull up Boston, Calvary Chapel, Rockland, and you can watch the whole retreat. You can watch each segment. It was a very moving so God showed me something in his word, and I have to believe him by faith in this. And what he showed me was, I asked him, what about our fellowship, Lord? And he showed me, for those willing to take the time to look to me, for those willing, they're going to take the time to look to me. He said, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I, I have to believe that. I believe that with all my heart, and I'm going to start crying. With all my heart and soul. But I believe that God has brought people into our fellowship. And, and to some, he may, it may be your last chance. And God is saying to you, I desire to pour my Holy Spirit into your life. I desire for you to know me. I desire for you to trust me, to walk with me, to look to me. And here I give you my word, which is God's promise. Let me ask you this. As long, much as you've known the Lord or his word, when has God ever broken his promise? Never. never. And he never will. And I believe him at his word. I will be seeking him like I've never sought him before in my life for the next few days. Because I believe what he spoke was true. And I believe he has a purpose and a reason to pour his spirit out. And it may not be what we think, but it is certainly for reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's about. It may be for you about turning your back on your old life. And just saying, I forsake you. You've done nothing but damage my life. And then stepping into the brand new life God has for you and seeking his face like you never have before. I really believe God at his word, so I'm just going to give it to you. I can't make you trust Jesus. I can't make you look to him. I can teach you his word and I can hold his promise out to you. And God is saying, I want more than just to be your Sunday service. I want to be the God who rules and reigns in your heart and in your life every moment of your life. So I challenge you, in the next few days, what is a few days compared to eternity? 
What is a few days compared to your whole life to just take the time and seek his face? You know, the disciples were in the upper room. They were praying. They were together. They were looking to him. And God poured his spirit out upon them. And I pray that for each and every one of us here today. So let's pray before we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. First of all, Lord, to be called your children, to be saved by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. To know, Lord, that you love us and that you've gone so far out of your way to save us. Thank you for that, Lord. And now a time that we have gotten the, the privilege of praising your holy name in song. We thank you for that. So, Father, now open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Let them be soft and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in the teaching of your word. Father, that we might hear your heart, that we might hear your voice and walk towards you, to look towards you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 We're in 1 Peter chapter 3. I've titled this, Putting These Things Into Practice, because Peter has been showing us what it means to walk the Christian life. What Peter has been doing, we're going to look at verses 8, probably through uh, 17, maybe. But Peter's been writing to the believers throughout Asia Minor because of the great persecution that they were facing. And he's been pinpointing in this section of his letter the need to prepare for the fiery trials that they were facing because the trials were not going away. These persecutions, these sorrowful pains were not going away anytime soon. And Peter was telling them, you've got to prepare every single day, prepare to face these trials for the glory of God. And in the midst of it all, he begins to discuss right here the mutual love of Christ between all believers. There should be a harmony that prevails between each one of us as believers. He urges them to get their eyes off of the persecution and the pain and the suffering that they're facing and to look towards Jesus and to put into practice the important qualities of the Christian life that lead to harmony between one another. The command we've been given by Jesus is to love one another as Christ loves us. That alone shuts down division within the church and it shows the world Christ is real. It shows them he's alive and that he's the un, un, unity, unity, unity between us. And there's a blessing in that. And, and, you know, we look to Scripture all the time. And, we, you know, Wednesday nights we walk through the Old Testament. We look at a, we're always looking at a picture in Scripture through the grace of God of what our life is like. Walking in Christ. So in what it means to look towards Jesus in the midst of a heavy trial... How do you look to Jesus Christ in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your heavy trials? Great pictures are given to us in Scripture that we might see what that looks like, that we might follow its example. One of them is in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king made this great golden statue. Remember the story? made this great golden statue, and, and when the, the sound of the bagpipes and the music begins to play, everybody will bow down and give honor to the statue. And if somebody doesn't do it, they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And the, and the music plays all over the world. They have statues, all in his land. The music plays, and everybody bows down, and there's three young Hebrew men, not young, maybe older, With their arms crossed. They're not bowing down. And Nebuchadnezzar flies into a rage. And he drags him up and and he says, why will you not bow down the music? I commanded the music to play and I commanded you to bow down. This is what they said. We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter, O king. 
If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. Fire up that furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been. And bound those men in ropes. And they bound him up with rope and he tossed him into the fiery furnace. And yet he looked into the fiery furnace. And what did he see? He saw four men. And he turned to his, the guards. Did we not throw three men in there? Yes, O king, we threw three men in there. And he looked and says, I look and so, why do I see four men walking in the midst of the fire? And one of them resembles the son of God. Shook him to the core. You know, so they're without harm. These men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what does it mean to look towards Jesus Christ in the midst of your fiery trial? It means walking with him in the midst of your fiery, painful trial. It's not, I'll, I'll catch up with you on Sunday. Oh, maybe I'll, meet, I'll make Wednesday service means right now in the midst of my fiery trial, I'm looking to you. I can't figure this out. In fact, bound up with ropes inside a fiery furnace, you are the only hope I have. And they looked towards him and they walked with him. And they talked with him, and he spoke with them. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they become our example of what we should do, what we should choose to do every time we face pain, every time we face affliction, every time we face persecution or suffering, looking to Jesus, walking with Jesus. And what Peter does here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 8 down through 16 or 17 or so, uh, he, he gives the believers three specific instructions of experiencing the blessings of God's unity in the body, even in the worst of times. Did you ever have a time in your life when you were so beat down you couldn't even smile? Ever been there? I've been there in my life. I know some of you have. And yet inside me, the spirit of the living God was alive. Though my face wouldn't smile, my heart was singing joy. Because I wasn't alone. I was looking to Jesus Christ. And this is what Peter's showing here. There's three things we're going to look at that stand out in this part of the chapter. And he's going to tell them, this is what you do. This is not what you hear. This is what I want you to do to maintain the unity of Christian love in the midst of your fiery trial. First thing we're going to look at, cultivating God's love. The second thing, practicing the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it is a practice. It's something you learn to do every day in your life. And the third thing is maintaining a good conscience. If I don't maintain a good conscience, I'm not going to hear the Holy Spirit. Do you ever wonder if it's my, is it the Holy Spirit speaking to me? Or is it just my conscience? The answer is yes. Yes, you got a good, clean conscience that's filled with the word of God. You can bet the Holy Spirit speaking to you through it. He's not going to tell you, in my conscience, I've been studying the word of God, trusting in what he says. Lord, do you think I should rob that bank? I think you should. Go right ahead. Pay all your bills. No, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's you. He leans towards good, and that's the good of Christ in all things. So let's look at verses. We're going to look at verse 8 through 12. This is cultivating God's love. Peter says, to sum it up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for that very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. Then he quotes the Psalms here. He says, for the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil 
and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So here, Peter's showing the church in the midst of their fire trial how to cultivate God's love. And his encouragement here is based on God's love for us and our love for one another. So this is a lesson that Peter had to learn, uh, and he had a hard time learning it if you read the scriptures at all. And he's writing them this. He's actually writing as a living example. Peter had a real difficult time loving some people, and he had a real difficult time loving the Lord. And he had to learn through trials and suffering to love the Lord and to love God's people, no matter who they were. It's as if Peter's saying, this is what I've learned as a follower of Jesus Christ over the last 60 years, and it was really difficult for me to learn this. But we're called by God to cultivate his love. And it's done by receiving his love for us. And then by loving one another, it's learned by practice. You have to do it. It doesn't just come. It's something we step into. So he says in verse 8, to sum up all of you, Right? The term sum up means finally. It's like just as the whole law of God is summed up in this, that God so loved us, so too we ought to love one another. So the fulfillment of God's law is summed up in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. So what Peter's saying here is to sum up all that I've just taught you, let's look deep into our lives and start practicing this. There's something God wants us to put to practice. And it's not being religious. It's actually walking out his living word. And it's walking in it every day. And he says, all of you. This is really cool. Who does that apply to? All of you. It's all of us. Every believer. Every single one. So he says, all of you. Be harmonious. It means be of one mind. Be harmonious. Be of one mind. It's actually a musical term, and it means adapt towards each other for the better. And here he's speaking directly of spiritual matters. You think of a guitar player and a drummer practicing together to make a good sound. The truth is, each one has to bend to the other. Each one has to give preference to the other. So the end result sound is harmony. That's why if you have a lead guitar player solo, why does he play alone? Because he's, he's all about him. But if you connect him with the drummer, now they have to bend towards each other to make a harmonious sound. And that's what he's saying here, literally, um, each one bending for that. So be harmonious. And then he says, be sympathetic. That means compassionate. Means be willing to suffer with one another. As one member of the body suffers, sharing with them in their feelings and being considerate and understanding whether they're in sorrow or joy. That means you cry with those that are crying. You weep with those that weep. You laugh with those that laugh. Sometimes we do that as believers. People call us hypocrites. How can you cry over here and then you laugh over here? He goes, over here, they're weeping. You lost a loved one or something happened. There's a tragedy. I'm going to cry with you. Why? Because I hurt too. And over here, someone just, you know, won the lottery. Yeah, I'll rejoice with them. Woohoo! you won the lottery. It's great. Or whatever the case is. It's, it's, it's being uh, compassionate with one another. Then he says, and be brotherly means as brothers. It literally means having a fervent affection towards one another in the body or in the church. It means making the choice to have a devoted warmth towards each other. You know what that means? That my love for you doesn't just happen. It means I have to make the choice every day of my life to love you more than I love myself. And I need the Holy Spirit in my life to do that. We all do. And yet that's a command given by Christ. 
And then he says uh, to be kind-hearted. Kind-hearted means tender-hearted. Now, don't get me wrong in this. As believers, we're called to be tender-hearted, but I'm not a pacifist in any way, shape, or form. All right? You break into my house, you're going you're gonna to walk away bloody and broken. That's a guarantee. Or what happened at McDonald's, I don't know if you heard it, what happened at the restaurant with my granddaughter, but I, someone almost died. You gotta go, no, you go after my granddaughter, man. You're going after my heart, and I will put you down, and uh, that's just what it's going to be. And I'll love you all the way. <laughs> I'll do it as kind-hearted and tenderly as I can, that's for sure. But we're called to be kind-hearted. It means choosing to be tender towards one another. And again, it directly speaks of within the fellowship of God's people. It doesn't speak out in the world. We're to be kind out in the world. Don't get me wrong. But he's speaking directly of within the fellowship. Whether I like it or not, or you do something I don't like, my responsibility before God is to be kind-hearted towards you. That my love for you be true. And again, that's something that's practiced every day among one another in the fellowship. Uh, literally, tender-hearted, making the choice to not be angry or aggressive, making the choice to not pull away because you don't like someone or something someone said, or because you can't have your own way, or because it's not working out to your advantage. To be kind-hearted, you put it to practice in your life. And that's what Peter's showing there. And then he says, humble in spirit. And humble in spirit means courteous. It literally is the word for chivalrous in that. Um, it means be humble in spirit. Carry the weight of friendship everywhere you go. I remember John Corson, Pastor John Corson, he always used to say, when I look at people, I look at them as believers. Now either they're not a believer yet and they're about to be one, or they are a believer and they're solid. But I don't segregate people. I look at everybody the way God. When God sees human beings, whether they're living in sin or not, he wants them saved. Every one of them. And we're to view people the same way. And, and his love is to stand out strong in that. So it's, it's carrying friendship. It literally means shunning stiffness and shunning a sour, sullen temper. It means putting aside the severe, hard, and rigid manner of your dealings with the body of Christ. Really simply just making the choice to be considerate uh, with one another. And then in verse uh, 9 and 10, he says, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you are called for that very purpose, to inherit a blessing. And then he quotes Psalm 34 here. And he says, For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What Peter does here when he quotes from Psalm 34 is he shows the New Testament church what the Old Testament church was called by God to do. Real simply, it's what they didn't do. They didn't walk out his commandments. And his commandments were not like trying to rigidly stick to the law. It was simply, walk, be kind to one another. Be considerate. If God raises up a leader and you don't like the leader, who should be on their face crying out to God? You. If you don't like the leader that God raised up, you, Lord, there's something wrong. God may show you, really? Maybe it's pride in your heart. If God raises up someone, then he's, he's raised them up. That's important. One of the, one of, one of the things that, that shows a true leader in the church is that they, if they're directed, like let's say I would go to an assistant pastor and say, I need you to just step away for a time and go do this, and I'm going to raise somebody else up. If he walked around sullen and mad and angry, he took my position. Whoa. Whose position? That's God's position. I should be able to be redirected by God in any position. I'm up here teaching his word. It doesn't make me greater than you. I should be able to sweep the floor as 
good as anybody else. And I do. That, what's that? If somebody grabs a broom, do I get mad? Someone took my position. You know, it's like, no. Be directed by the Lord and, and what he has. So we're called by God to not speak evil in return for what's been spoken in evil of us. We're called by God to avoid evil and to do good. We're called by God to seek peace and pursue it. How do I do that? I leave all in the hands of a righteous God who will vindicate his own. And you know what? God will never fail in vindicating his own. That's a guarantee. We just talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How did that work out for them? They're in the fire. They're walking with Jesus. They're talking with Jesus in the midst of their fiery trial. Nebuchadnezzar looked in and he saw them walking with Jesus. And what did he say to them? He said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come here. He was shook to the core. This before, a few minutes before, as he threw them into the fire, angry and in rage against them. And yet watching them walk with Jesus in the midst of a fiery trial. I guarantee you as they're walking with Jesus, they're not like, uh, 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 uh. they're just walking and talking with them. And he calls them, come out, you servants of the most high God. The king gave homage to almighty God, the God of the Hebrews. And in all of the land that Nebuchadnezzar was given by God, he exalted God Almighty because of what he watched with his eyes. And, and the picture there, God never fails in vindicating his own. And you know what? It's something we're never called to do. I don't have to justify myself. I don't have to vindicate myself. My justification is Christ. And my vindication is is Christ. My Lord, Jesus Christ, is what he allows anything he wants to be put on my plate every day. And mine is to consume that for the glory of God. And as he gives me the choice, when he says something like, the one who desires life and to love and seek good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from seeking deceit, then I, then I realize I have now the responsibility as a child of God to turn from things, to put things behind me, to change my language, to start using things for the good of God, not for the good of myself, for God's glory, not for my own glory. He says here, must, he uses the word must a lot. And must here means a, a necessity, an obligation. When he says you must do this, it's like the binding power of a vow. And I know in today's day and age, marriage vows really outside of the church mean nothing to anybody anymore. And yet they mean so much to God. Because that's a vow. I made a promise. I'm making an oath. And I'm backing it up with God. And I make a promise to love you for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Till death do us part. I mean, this is a promise I'm making. It's not some cheap words. And the world uses cheap words in marriage today. I've heard people write their own vows and they're scary. I love you with all my body. <laughs> really? That's frightening. How about let's let God be the center of this, regardless of what the world says in that. So when he says must, there's a, the power, the binding power of a promise, the binding power of an oath. Think of must uh, this way. Um, <clears throat> it's the binding power of the kindness of God in our lives. And he's calling us to walk that out each and every day. When he says must, you think this is the binding power of God's kindness upon me. So there's, there's four things. Must. We must deliberately decide to love life. 
He says, the one who desires life, it means to love life, to love and see good days. This is an act of the will. It's our will, not God's will. It is God's will for us, but it's an act of my will to love life and to see good days. If you're an honest, true husband here or have been one, and you wanted the best for your family, you wanted what was good for your family, that's the, that's the push that's here. Or if you're a mother and you have children and you want the best for your children, you want the good for your children, and you speak it in such a way as that you challenge them against evil. No, that's the wrong road. Listen to me. I am older than you. I've been down that road. It burn me. It will burn you. This is the good path. Stay on it. And the temptations are there to drag you away. But stay on this path. And it's, it's pressing in that. So we must deliberately decide to love life. And that's what he's saying. Um, and and it's, it's an act of our own will. It becomes an attitude of our faith that chooses to seek the best in every situation. We always talk about this like, is the glass half full or half empty? As a believer, it's always half full. Keep it that way. Well, no, it's half empty. Throw that life away. It's half full. God wants to fill you to the top. And he wants you overflowing. He's not settled for you being half full. At the retreat, we talked about uh, needing, the need for a refreshment of the Holy Spirit in our life. I think Charles Spurgeon said it, and he's, he talked about a woman came to him and said, well, I've already received the Holy Spirit. Why do I need more of him? He said, it's pretty easy, man. We leak <laughs> all the time. We need more of him all the time. We need a, a fresh filling. And there's a desperate need for that in our, in our day and age today. And then secondly, we must control our tongue. He says, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 99% of all the problems in our lives are caused by the wrong words spoken at the wrong time. That's how they are. And we're to love. Love doesn't spite back. In words, we've all learned the wrong words, haven't we, in our life? All of us. We know, I used to know uh, when I worked at a tar Chinese restaurant for like two weeks, but all the Americans that worked there, the only words they knew in Chinese were the curse words. Because that's what the Chinese cooks said all the time. <laughs> like, we all know the bad words. We know them in every language. I, I grew up next to an Italian family. My mom's Italian 100%. And I, I learned Italian. Guess which words I learned? <laughs> I didn't learn Merry Christmas. I learned something worse than that. <laughs> we put that behind us. It's easy to get all the bad words, but we're called by God as an obligation to learn to speak, to use our tongue, to use self-control with our tongue. Uh, because it's just part of what that walk is. And then third, we must do good and hate evil. He says we must, he must turn away from evil and do good. If I desire life, good life, and to seek good, the good of God, then, then, then it means to avoid, not to avoid sin because it's wrong, but literally to avoid sin because God hates it. And I want to honor him. And regardless of what the world says today, as far as all the transgender stuff goes, transgender is perversion. Oh, don't say that. God said it. And God meant it. And whether men or women decide to live elsewhere, otherwise, that's their problem. But as far as our nation goes, the nation, I went to war to fight for our freedoms and came home scarred in my heart. I, I fought for freedom. That's not the freedom I fought for. So a man can become a woman and a woman become a man. God says that's evil. So what do I say? That's evil. Whether the world likes it or not. 
Whether they come and stone me with stones or not, it's re- it doesn't change what it is. It's perversion. God calls it perversion. We must do good and hate evil. You know, God calls us to hate something. We're to hate evil. Why? Because he hates it. Why? Why does God hate it? Because he knows what it does to the human soul. And it burns the soul. And it scars the soul. And God knows that. And he shuns it in that way. And we are too. And the fourth, he says, we must seek peace and pursue it. You know, if we go out and seek trouble, you find it in a matter of seconds. You put 50 people in a room and let them stay there for a week and then pull them out one at a time, every one of them will tell you what's wrong with everybody else. Right away, they'll know exactly. This is what's wrong with this one. This is what's wrong with this one. But yet we're to seek peace and pursue it. We're we're to be, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. And pursuing peace, the word pursuing here, means work hard at it. You know why? It doesn't come automatically. If you're married, you understand that. I love you so much. I love you so much. Let's get married. Everything will be fine. Everything will be great. You love me so much. I love you. We'll never have an argument. We'll never not see eye to eye on something. It'll just, it'll just be bliss and happiness and all that. Then you get married, and you're like, Whoa, who is she? She's like, who's he? What is that about? And you learn, you know, this, seek peace and pursue it. This is something they got to work at. Some people have to work harder than others, but it, we work at it, and that's just the truth there. You know, um, sometimes it's not possible to find peace in certain situations, but we are to work at it. We're to pursue it as hard as we can. And all of this just simply means that we're called by God to exercise moderation as we relate to one another. We're called by God not to create problems because we can't have our own way. You know, we're to cultivate God's love um, by letting God's love develop between us. And that's a practice. It's something that we we were to walk out each and every day. And that's cultivating God's love. You get down to verse 13. Now he's talking about practicing the lordship of Jesus Christ. He says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. What's he say? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You and I have been given the greatest hope that any human being could ever have on this earth, and that is the complete forgiveness of our sins and eternal life with God in heaven, surrounding in his love, surrounded in it, for all of eternity. And we're to give a defense for that. And people go, oh, you're just, you, got, you religious crazy nuts. Like, we're not religious crazy nuts. We're followers of a Savior. The same Savior who stepped into our sinful lives and offered us forgiveness and eternal life. The same Savior that's offering that to you. The same one who is waiting with arms open to scoop you up and love you. You know, God put it in every human heart, the need to be loved. Everybody get that? And people chase sex, they chase drugs, they chase relationships, they chase, you you name it. It's out there to chase. And the only love that will satisfy the human soul is the love of God. And that is only found through faith in Jesus Christ. And God came so that we might receive that love and be secure in that love and be settled in that love. Practicing the Lordship of Jesus Christ is sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. And literally means set apart Jesus Christ as Lord in your heart. 
Your heart is the seat of your emotions. It's where your thoughts and feelings meet your emotions. And it births something. That's the heart. That's where God wants to dwell. Where my feelings that run rampant with my passions, and then my emotions that run rampant with my passions, right in the center of that, he's saying, let me be Lord. Sanctify me. Set me apart as Lord in that place in your soul. Because I'll take your feelings and I'll take your emotions and I'll work with them. I'll prove to you you're mine. I'll prove to you you're saved. I will prove to you that you're forgiven. I'll prove to you you're my child. Let me do it. How do I do that? Sanctify me. Set me apart in that place. Because I will go there and I'll be Lord. And a lot of times we live in fear because that's the place we never tell anybody about. Deep inside. Sometimes we're not even able to speak about what goes on at that place. There are some places in my heart I don't think I've ever been able to express to my wife. I've been married 38 years, I think. Something like that. How long have we been married? 30, 39? 40, 40, 40, 40, we'll stop there. Anyway. I don't know. Feels like 20. It, uh, <laughs> this place is I, I can't even talk about. Not, this place I don't even probably know about. I don't hide anything. But sometimes I can't even express what's inside there. And Jesus is saying, let me be Lord there. And sometimes I go, Lord, it's so dark there. Lord, I don't want to defile you. You know what God does? Ha! Defile me. I'm spotless. You can't defile me. I know what human beings are all about. I know what I got when I got you. Do you know that? God knows what he got when he got you. You're thinking, oh, you know what you got? You got me, Lord. Ooh, you got the wrong. No, God's like, no, I know all about you. I know the deep recesses of your heart. And you know what? Let me be Lord there. But if I let you be Lord there, you'll know the deep recesses of my heart. That's right. That's what I want to do. I'm going to wash them clean. I'm going to stop them from hurting you. I'm going to stop them from giving you false direction. Let me be Lord there. And, and that's what it means here. It's practicing that. You know, the fear of God conquers all other fears. And as Christians, when we're faced with a crisis, when we're tempted to give in to our fears, that's when we make wrong decisions. But if I'm sanctifying Christ as Lord in my heart, I never need to fear man. I never need to fear circumstances. I stand there. And then he says, make a defense to make a defense for, for um, the hope that is in you. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart and then make a defense. It means give an account for the hope that's in you. To defend by the fortification of the truth of the hope that's in me. You have given me a future hope. And maybe you haven't learned, maybe you're here today, you haven't learned to make your stand on that. Stand on that. I'm a child, there's a song that we hear on the radio I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Take your stand there. Because we're a children of God. We're no longer bound and slave to fear. What, what are men going to say? What, what about the circumstance? How do I face tomorrow? I am a child of God. That's how I face tomorrow. And that's how I will always face tomorrow. I am a child of God. It, it literally means facing my trials, all the trials that are before me, and fearing God enough to trust him through them, no matter what the outcome may be. Lord, I'm trusting you with this. You know, I'm going in Thursday for my cancer operation. They, I had one little spot, cancer, and they thought maybe it was going inside around the eye and now I got four spots around the whole eye and they think it's around the whole eye and I might lose my eye. But what am I doing? I'm, I'm not going to go, oh, I'm going to lose my eye. <laughs> no, I, 
I got another one. And I'll be up here like this. You know, teaching. Be like a true Vermonter. I don't teach you. There I am. <laughs> if I lose my eye, I lose my eye. So what? To me, it, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that Christ is Lord in my heart. And I'm able to face whatever trial he is allowed on my plate. I found out that my doctor, that's the surgeon, is the same surgeon that did my ear. Because I had cancer in my ear, went to the canal. And as he was working on it, he said to me, do you want to watch it? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so he put a mirror over there and I, I got to watch them do the surgery on my ear. It was sickening. Anyway, but... Um, <laughs> He said to me, your ear's going to be sore for a couple weeks. And after they flattened it out that big, I was like, I can see that. <laughs> of course, I wasn't nodding my head. It was all stiff. But uh, I got to talk and share with him. Found out he's a very serious Catholic, Roman Catholic. He said, I go to church every Sunday. I'm faithful. I'll never miss a Sunday service. And, and as he's working on me, he's, he's talking to me. He says, so, you know, what's the difference between Christianity and being Catholic. And I thought, wow. And I walked through the gospel about a relationship with Jesus Christ and how he came. Well, yeah, he says, I believe all that. But, you know, I, I go, why do you go to church? Well, I find solace there. I go and it's quiet. And my life is really busy. I said, Jesus wants to give you solace in your heart. He wants to be the Lord of your heart. And as I'm sharing this, the nurse is hitting his arm going, told you, I told you, I've been telling you this. I thought, yeah. <laughs> well, he's the same guy. I guarantee you that conversation is going to come up. I'm going to ask him. Now you're working on my eye. Have you tried trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Wouldn't that be awesome if I could come back here next week and tell you he's born again? Wouldn't that be a blessing? A tremendous blessing. We'll see. But as far as I'm concerned, I believe this cancer is an open door to reach a person that maybe has not been reached yet. And I can view it that way because of who my Lord is, who my Savior is. He's sanctified as Lord in my heart. I'm practicing the Lordship of Jesus Christ by facing that trial for the glory of God. And he says, and do it with gentleness and reverence. Okay, gentleness, I'm not to shove Christ down people's throat. I learned that the hard way many, many, many years ago. I was a Bible thumper. Everybody get that? I had my Bible. I was going to make sure you knew Christ. That's a guarantee. I remember one day the Lord said, spoke to my heart. He said, put the book down. I'm like, yes, on someone's head. That's what you want. He's like, no, put it away. And he told me, go love them. And I thought, that's your responsibility. Mine's to thump them with the word. No, God's like, no, go love them. Man, did I have a lot to learn with that. First people he sent me to were these bikers. I'm like, okay, I'll go love him. Then a prostitute, go love her. And I loved her the way Christ loved her. And I watched her come to know Jesus Christ. And then years later, I, I got to meet her the day before her wedding. She was marrying a man at her church. You know, that, that's, that's practicing the lordship of Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen in one day. It's every single day. And then in verse 16 and 17, he's telling us, maintain a good conscience. And this is really important because my conscience, that's where the Holy Spirit is going to speak to me. And if my conscience is seared, I won't hear his voice. He says, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. What he's saying here is a good conscience means literally to have a good conscience. Hedge, guard, and protect a good conscience. 
And the, the word conscience itself means to know within. It speaks of the internal knowledge of the judgment of right and wrong or the approval or disapproval of them. It's being able to discern right and wrong, good and evil, and then making a discerning fact among them. This is evil. You say it's evil. I turn from this. This is good. You say it's good. Right here in your word, I turn to this. Though my flesh wars against that, in my conscience, I make the choice to do what's good because of what God says is good here. And that's what he's showing here. And the conscience, I guess you can compare it to a window that lets light, the light of God's truth into your mind, into your heart, and into your soul. And if I persist in disobeying the word of God, the window then gets dirtier and dirtier until no light can shine in. Then I pick up the word, makes no sense to me. Why would God kill that person and keep that person alive? That's dumb. I'm not, I'm not reading that word. And, the, and the, the, the window gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And that's what he's showing here. And, and what happens is the dirtier that window gets, it leads to a defiled conscience or what we would call a seared conscience. And a conscience is that seared is one that's been so sinned against, it's no longer sensitive to what's right or wrong. It means it can no longer hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, which then makes it possible for the conscious to be poisoned so that it becomes to approve the things that are bad and begins to accuse the things that are good. It just reverses. We look at a day and age today when, the, when you know, it, it, it's, it's frightening that a young man would come home to his parents and stand before them and say, I have something to say to you. And the parents go, oh, what is it? What is it? I found out that I'm a normal young man. I'm straight. And they fall to the floor and weep. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Wow. Not my son. He's not going to be straight in today's day and age. Now, you're gay, and I'm going to send you to school to prove it. Hold it. A seared conscience no longer has the ability to discern from the word of God what is right and what is wrong. And it becomes backwards. And you know what? White becomes what? Black. And good becomes evil. And anybody that's walking white is rotten. And anybody that's walking good is evil. And we live in that day and age right now. In fact, some of our minds, maybe even here in this room, have been tainted by that. And God's saying, who am I to you? Who are God's people to you? Just acquaintances at church, that's all? Or how about united in harmony as the children of God? The creator of all things. The one who's given you his word to govern what's right and to govern what's wrong. Do you love your family or your friends enough to say, you know what? I know that you've chosen that lifestyle, but that's a perversion. Or who are you to judge me? I'm not judging you. I'm stating the fact of what the standard of my life says. And here in America, I still have freedom of speech. And that's not hate speech, to speak truth. Though the world may say it is, we're called to speak it no matter what. You know, as a believer... Studying the word of God, I'll better understand the will of God and my conscience then becomes sensitive to what's right or wrong. And if I don't grow in spiritual knowledge in obedience to God's word, I get a weak conscience and what happens is any small little thing that happens, I'm stirred up by it and shakes me to the core. And God's saying, that's not what I have for you. A good conscience is one that approves when we think or do uh, what's right and disapproves when we think or do what's wrong. So right and wrong in our life is determined by the word of God, not the American standard, 
and to me, not even the laws of our government because they're skewed. But right and wrong is determined by God's word. And we're to walk according to that, even if it goes against everything in the world. And God has given us our conscience as a safeguard, but only when the word of God is allowed to, and the Holy Spirit's allowed to be our teacher. If I allow the Holy Spirit to teach me through the word of God, then my conscience becomes a safeguard for me and, and, and will direct me to what's right and to what's good for the glory of God. And who does the Holy Spirit speak of? Always, Jesus. Holy Spirit always leads someone to Christ. He'll never lead anybody anywhere else. So if he's guiding my conscience according to the word of God, then it's going to lead people towards Christ no matter what. So we're called by God. So what Peter's writing to the church, and they're facing some evil times. Persecution, heavy persecution. I don't think it's any different, maybe not the persecution part, but the evil times I think are heavier today than back then. We live in a, an evil world. An evil world. It's a dark world. So when times of difficulty come to the church today, there's a must that we've been given. We must do the same things they did back then. And what did Peter show? We must cultivate God's love. Why? Because we need each other's help and encouragement every day as never before. Secondly, we must maintain a good conscience. Why? Because a good conscience makes a strong backbone and a courageous witness, and it opens our ears to the leading of the Holy Spirit according to God's word. And number three, we must put to practice the lordship of Jesus Christ. Why? Because if I live under the fear of God, I'll never fear what man has to do with me. I'll never fear the circumstance in front of me. I'll just press on and trust him for all that he's got because God is good and his love for us is never ending. I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 11 on down. Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He said, our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians, and our heart is open wide. And you are not restrained by us, but you're restrained by your own affections. Now in the like exchange, I speak as to children. He says, open wide to us. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Bial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. He says, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. That's a promise given to every one of us. God is saying, you, you trust me, you trust my son by faith, you do well. But now draw near to me. How do I do that, Lord? By doing what was just said. You are the temple of the living God. And don't let any other standard show you different. And when evil comes knocking at your door, you trust the truth of God's word and you tell evil, I shun you, evil. I walk in truth. I shun you, darkness. I turn from that and I walk in the light. And I walk not in the world, but in the midst of God's children where I belong. And you know what? It shows the world that our God is real. It's not just some religious thing. We serve a true living God whose love is physical and tangible. Why? It's, it's seen between each other. That's why. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would take your word that was taught today and plant it deep in every heart. 
Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit. Let it begin to take root there so the enemy could not steal it away. Let it begin to bear fruit quickly, Lord, that eyes might turn to your son and walk with him. Help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, by your living word, make choices that are right and good. Help us desire to love and seek good days, as your word tells us, to pursue peace and turn from evil. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We offer this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.